Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and I'm pretty excited about tonight's show. We have Jacques Vallée, and he'll be on, uh, I mean, later on in the show, we'll have Alan Silverman on, and we're going to be talking about a great new film. I had the chance uh, to watch it, and I think it is absolutely excellent. So that is uh, called A Wit- Witness to Another World. Witness of Another World, pardon me. And it's coming out, I believe, in just a few days. And I'm just going to tell the listener, it is a great film. We'll be talking about that um, today with both Jacques and later on with Alan uh, Silverman. And Alejandro is not on the show today. I just didn't have... uh, He was actually on the road. So I just took this opportunity and to run the first 30 minutes or so with uh, my great guest. He really doesn't need introduction, but as uh, I say almost every week, we do have a lot of new people uh, listening to the show. I'll just put it this way. Um, Jacques is my number one choice for any guest that I'd ever want on the show. So I am that excited about it. And um, I'm just going to introduce you. Jacques, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm uh, humbled by by that introduction. Uh, sometimes I joke that uh, I'm the only uh, only ufologist who doesn't know what UFOs are because I've <laughs> studied, as you know, a lot of cases going back to uh, working with uh, Dr. Heineck, of course, and and also working with people in France and in in Europe. Um, I don't have a favorite explanation, uh, obviously. The you know outer space extraterrestrial explanation is always a possibility. It's always there, but I've uh, occasionally made enemies by pointing out there were other things that the phenomenon did that did not didn't match any any hypothesis we have yet, which is where science takes over. I mean that's why it's interesting. I I think that's that's true. I remember when uh, we met. In uh, Phoenix, we were in line together at the hotel, and I said to you something along the lines that uh, I've been doing my show for a number of years now, and I know less than I did about UFOs than when I started. (laughs) It just seems like it's such a mystery, and uh, I really like that uh, you don't have any one explanation, and that's kind of the uh, benefit of doing this show is hearing people's ideas, because that's really all they are at this point. Um, is just ideas. Well, we see new ideas, fortunately, but we also see new, uh, new pieces of data, new phenomena that are being uncovered as more and more people become involved, and that's uh, you know that's how research functions. Right, right. Um, for now, you uh, you had uh, a sighting very early on in your life. Over in France, do you want France? Do you want to talk a, a little bit about that and just kind of give? Uh, well, the, uh, go ahead. Th- this was uh, the year after a major wave uh, over Western Europe in 1954. I was uh, about 16 at the time. Uh, this was during the summer vacation. Uh, very clear afternoon, uh, sunny afternoon. Uh, I was uh, helping my father with some work inside the house, and my mother was in the yard, uh, tending to, uh, you know, the the yard, and she saw it first and called us, and I rushed out, and I saw, essentially, a disc that was something like uh, half a mile away, I would estimate, uh, close to, and I had a reference as a a church uh, needle, you know, that was uh, uh, very very clearly about half a mile away and the the object seemed to be in that vicinity above the church uh the next day uh i spoke to a friend of mine from school who lived another half mile up the hill from me he had seen the same thing and had looked at it with binoculars so he had three witnesses it was it looked like a shiny disc with a dome on top uh, you know pretty much what wow. so many people have uh, have described. And at the time, we didn't report it. There was no real place to report it. Um, And we thought that it might be a prototype of something that would eventually become known. And 
Of course, that never happened. There is no such <laughs> there is no such craft uh, in existence flying around today. Right, right. Um, you know, that's one of the arguments you hear a lot as far as, uh, you know, people will talk today about seeing, for instance, the Nimitz um, UFO case, the Tic Tac UFO. People will say, well, that's, you know, that's, that's military. But these things have been having this same type of behavior, you know, going way back, uh, as you know. And, uh, you know, that's one of the arguments you never hear too many people talk about is that, uh, you know, these strange... Uh, craft doing unbelievable things have been around for a long time. And, you know, one of the things you hear about the most, or I don't want to say the most, but you do hear a lot of is the triangle UFOs. And uh, there's, yes. you know, there's cases that go way back. I just spoke to someone recently that back in the 1970s saw a triangle. You know, it was her words, not mine, you know, so they... It's not like they're a new model that comes out, but the disc sure, sure seemed like um, most people were seeing back in the day. Well, I know, you know, you're going to be speaking with Alan Silverman about that movie uh, that was mm -hmm. done about a case in Argentina. That's what is so unique about that, that case, is that there is no, you know, it's not military. It doesn't have to do with you know, the CIA or cover-up or an aircraft carrier or the Pentagon or any of that that we like to talk about, you know, in the U.S. Uh, it's a case of a, uh, uh, you know, a young boy, 12-year-old boy uh, on an isolated farm in a very flat, nondescript part of the country suddenly being confronted with something completely extraordinary. And there is no... There is no explanation. I mean, this was not military. This was not a hoax. This was not any of that. And we were able to document the circumstances extremely well. And what is unique in the whole history of the phenomenon is that we were able to uh, document his life, document what happened to him uh, in the rest of his life. Right. And including things that... Uh, continued phenomena that continued when he was an adult. Right. Now, in the area that Juan uh, was located, it, most likely he had never even heard of any type of situation like that. or At, had... at the time, no. And uh, I had met uh, people from Argentina at a, uh, at a conference, actually, in Mexico, and they had invited me to lecture in five uh, cities in Argentina, and they said, by the way, you have to lecture in Spanish, which, which sent me back to my books and <laughs> made me, uh, you know, uh, re, uh, relearn uh, enough Spanish so that I could do, you know, uh, a reasonable job of uh, presenting, uh, presenting the phenomenon. But then I said, if I do that, I want to spend one extra day have a free day after each lecture in every, as, as you know, Argentina is a very large country. Mm. It's uh, the size of Western Europe. And uh, there were these five different regions were very different. And they agreed to let me meet local investigators, UFO investigators in those different provinces, spending an extra day everywhere before we move to the next city. And that was extraordinary because, of course, I was exposed to a lot of different phenomena, a lot of different cases that they had already investigated, and this was one of them. And this was in the north of Argentina in a province called Entre Rios, between the rivers, which is uh, really in, in a, it's purely an agricultural area. It's very flat. And uh, this happened on an isolated farmhouse, isolated uh, instancia, where this young boy was charged with uh, taking care of the horses. And in the, in the morning, he had to round up the, the herd uh, and bring them close to, to the farmhouse to feed them and so on. And uh, as he went out, there was a lot of fog over the land, and in the fog was this extraordinary object. Now, I met him 
two years after his experience. So by the time I met him, he was 14. Uh, my wife was with me, and my wife was French. She was a child psychologist, and also the uh, the uh, school teacher uh, from uh, the school where the child went was uh, was with the family. They gathered everybody, uh, so the investigators were there. The family. I met his father, his mother, his siblings, and the school teacher. And my my wife has a con- had a conversation with the school teacher and. The, the child was a good student. He wasn't uh, the best student in the class, but he was, you know, very serious, very applied, didn't lie, didn't make up stories. And by the way, when you met his father, who was a true gaucho, uh, that was pretty clear that you wouldn't joke around around mm. his father. Mm. I know there's a, there's a part in the, the movie where he is... I think he actually goes to some type of conference or meeting or something like that, and it comes time for him to tell his story, and he just gets super emotional and he just can't do it. Um, he just breaks down. Yes, the the whole movie shows. Yes. that's what I, I know is very powerful because it shows something that you know we don't talk about very much in the literature, but the impact on the witness that this is something that's completely outside their reality and by the way it's outside our reality our everyday reality and i know just what i saw when i was you know when i was a kid has stayed with me all my life it probably motivated me to to get into this kind of research and i know many people who were motivated the same way and here alan contacted me alan is is a young you know a young filmmaker uh, an artist in Argentina, he contacted me three years ago, saying he had uh, was working on some other ideas and had met this man who by then was in his late 40s up in an isolated shack, essentially a cabin uh, up north in, in Argentina, uh, living essentially alone with his animals, very close to nature. Uh, very poor, hiring himself out to local landowners and local farmers to work around the farm. And uh, he had this incredible story. And it was a story that I had I had published a summary of it in one of my books, in a, in a book called Revelations. And uh, Alan wanted to come to San Francisco and interview me about, you know, what it was like when I met the family and I met this uh, this teenager who had had that experience and I said, well, uh, Alan, do you know about the other cases the same week in the same town? And he said, what other cases? Well, there were three other cases by adults, young adults in the same town of Venado Tuerto and uh, that I had documented in my report and I said, well, let's do two things. First, I'm going to send you my file the whole file, which was about 20 or 25 pages, including photographs I had taken at the time and my interview of everybody there. And then I said, if I could come to uh, Buenos Aires, we could close the circle with him. And maybe the encounter with me coming back from his past would help reunite the family because by then he was ostracized. He was pushed back by the family because this experience was so strange. And also, you know, help him uh, sort of close the circle in his own mind. And it will also help me because this was very emotional to me. And you'll see that in the movie, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a movie actor. Uh-huh. And y- you can see that I was very, very moved in meeting him again and in revisiting yes. the family. And I, I think we did a great job of helping him. And I think you, what you see in the movie is his transformation yes. from you know, being hunted by this phenomenon which is still around him and then emerging from it with uh, much more confidence and so on. And that's, that's really what the movie is all about. 
Right. And this dramatic situation that he had at some, at such a young age, you know, I imagine in some ways rather stunted him. And, um, you know, he he became uh, he becomes emotional quite a few times um, during the movie. But you're right. You can see a transformation. And uh, I really like when the story focuses on the people. And uh, I, I think Alan did a very nice job with that. I'd like to quote or paraphrase because I don't know it exactly, but there was a line you said um, during this movie, such as um, we see things as kind of a display, uh, an exhibition of images uh, back from like your background of subconscious. Um, that's one of the thoughts you have on what people are seeing. Do, would you mind explaining that just a little bit? A little bit? Yes. You know the the book by uh, Dr. Salisbury in Utah, who has done so much. Professor Salisbury uh, wrote a book about the sightings in northern Utah, and he was, uh, of course, a professor of biology at uh, at uh, Utah State and that at the University of Utah, uh, who did really the first very thorough assessment of the sightings there including the area of the famous ranch, by the way. And his book was called The Utah UFO Display, because he, the people that he interviewed, both the you know, people from the, the, the Mormon population and the Indian population in Utah, were describing something that wasn't so much mechanical. You know, we, we like to think in terms of technology, like, you know, around the Nimitz and so on. But those things can really display themselves in a whole variety of different things, as if they could they could paint an image of, of themselves, and they can look technological one moment and then turn into just a ball of light that goes through a wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not any, any technology we have, okay? This is so. So th that idea of the the display is very important, and you have to go beyond the the obvious technological interpretations. And uh, before I went to, so Alan agreed to uh, that I could come to Argentina instead of his coming to San Francisco, and I spent about ten days there. But before I went there, I relearned enough Spanish so that I could speak one on one. Yes. with Juan, and you'll see that in the movie there are parts where it's just the two of us together, because I didn't want to get into that aspect of it with an interpreter. I wanted to hear uh, his own words, and I wanted to speak with him in his own language, because it's just so, you know, so important. And I think that helped us also in, in closing that circle, that I was, you know, I wanted to be really close following his emotions and you know I don't cry a as easily as he as he does uh, but then I haven't had that kind of experience and uh, but it was obviously very emotional uh, for me as well right right yes I was actually pretty impressed with your Spanish um, you, you did pretty well. And I will tell the, the listener that uh, watching the movie, uh, don't feel it's a hindrance um, to have this movie because uh, in Spanish because there is some Spanish with subtitles, but the majority of the movie is actually in English. Um, so And it's very easy to follow all the way through. And uh, some interesting people. Um, did you re-meet any of the people besides Juan when you were there? That you had met before? Uh, well, I was delighted to uh, meet his family again, ah, and mm -hmm. it was was wonderful to help. That's not in the movie, but to help reunite him in a way emotionally with his family, because uh, the fact that we were there filming his experience, and the fact that I came back, and they had they remembered me. His father and his mother are still alive. Of course, his siblings are now, uh, you know, older. They are adult, young adults. Uh, so it, it helped reconnect, in, in a way, reconnect the family. And uh, I could afford to joke with his father. And it was, it was wonderful. It was joyful. 
you know, to, just to give you an anecdote, and again, it's not in the movie, but that's part of the human experience. His his father has a uh, a felt hat, you know, like a, not exactly a cowboy hat, but a gaucho hat. Mm-hmm. And I had a picture. I, I had brought my pictures of the days when I was there, you know, uh, 35 years before. And he had he had a hat, the same hat. So I, I told him, Signore, I sell me some sombrero, you know, it's the same hat. And he laughed. And, uh, you know, it was just so nice, you know, that uh, he laughed because it was the same hat. And <laughs> those are the little things, you know, that you have to spend the time. You have to. And, and so often in the U.S., you know, when, when there is a, an investigation done, a couple of investigators go there and they go there with a questionnaire, and they fill out the questionnaire with uh, the witness, and it's all very abstract and scientific and logical. But those experiences are not logical. They are not... Uh, you have to deal with the emotion. You have to deal with... And and then they never go back. And here, what's unique about this is that we have this extended time, and we have the testimony from different people at different times of his life over, really, over 40 years. And mm. that is a, a unique piece of testimony about the whole phenomenon. Do you think that he would have had a, a total different life if this didn't happen? I mean, like you mentioned, he's a, he's in a very remote area in this cabin, and it looks like, you know, he... He uh, hunts and everything, you know, for food and, and has his animals and gardens and things like that. Um, do you think, uh, I noticed at the end, he seemed to really enjoy being around, um, you know, family and in the village at the very end of the, the movie. Is Oh, there, there is no question. Uh, he felt estranged from his family. And, you know, so many witnesses go through that, so many witnesses of of close encounters. Uh, I remember I, I remember the working with Dr. Hynek and interviewing some of the uh, highway patrol people in the Midwest mm. uh, who had encounters and, and abductions and being unable to stay in the police force and having to resign. Uh, you know, uh, Loni Zamora in Socorro Right. Had that experience, being being ostracized because he was different. You know, he was a guy who had seen the flying saucer, and professionally that ruined his experience. And uh, many of these people went through divorces. Uh, mm-hmm. Their neighbors would throw stones at their house. I mean, they would be rejected as, you know, the guy who has done something a little strange and brought disrepute to the family or to the town. Uh, so many, I, I've seen that with so many witnesses, you know, both in, in Europe, in France, but also in, um, you know, certainly in the U.S. And uh, that's an aspect of it that nobody has looked at. Right. And the first thing that I have to do as, as you know, I, when I go to a site and is deal with the human situation before you pull out the questionnaire and you know, the compass and, uh, and the cameras and so on. You have to d- deal with the people as, as human beings. And very often they are hurt. They are hurt in their family, they are hurt in their friendships, and in their professions. Right, yes. I remember uh, watching some video, some documentary that was had taken place in either the early 60s or late 1950s, and there were people talking about their experiences back then. And I remember um, there was a man that said, if one landed right beside me, I wouldn't tell a soul after what I've gone through. So you're and, right. Uh, well, especially in the military, you know, there was, there was an, uh, an experience in, uh, uh, in Minnesota in uh, Minot, the famous Minot case of mm-hmm. the B-52, uh, that uh, had an object both on radar and visually, and one member of the crew went to the back of the aircraft in order not to see it. And his buddy said, why don't you want to look at it? 
And he said, well, I, you know, I'm interviewing with an airline next week. I don't want to <laughs> have to say that I've seen a flying saucer. Wow. Isn't that He did amazing? not want to see it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So the, the penalties in, in some of those, uh, in the military and in, in the police force, the penalty for seeing something that's unexplained you know, can be drastic. And what do you think about now? Do you think things have changed um, ever since, I mentioned earlier, ever since the article came out in the New York Times, people seem to be uh, more acceptable um, and I just wanted to get your your take on that. I know you have to go in a couple of minutes here, but uh, if well, you... I'm uh, I'm I'm okay. Uh, let Let's wait for Alan. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say hi to him. Uh, we've become you know close friends. Uh, I wish I could say yes, things have changed. I'm not so sure. I can tell you things have not changed very much in the scientific community. People are afraid for their reputation. They are afraid for their grants, for their budget. Uh, just almost as much today as they did. There isn't the same stigma, uh, but people still look at you funny. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much in Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley is so strange anyway, right. uh, in yeah. many other ways, but uh, in the scientific community in general, and I think that's still true in in the military. Uh, and I think uh, maybe the Nimitz experience we've changed things because so many of these uh, pilots were highly respected, and everybody knows they're not lying. That's right. Yes, um, I think that's made such headway. And you know, David Fravor. Some people um, have said a couple things. Um, lately, since he was on Joe Rogan recently, but I think um, I, I think there's absolutely no doubt about th the quality of the witness that he is, and yes. I, I think it has definitely made made a difference. And I, I would say that's myself. I'd say that's one of the top cases, just because of um, you know what what has happened with that. Um, you know, with it just seems to have moved things forward a bit. And I don't know if that's, you've probably seen things move forward many times in your long career looking into this. Um, and do you have hopes? Uh, I mean, I don't think there's uh, going to be a disclosure, so to say, but it, it just seems more acceptable. You know, what, what in a way is ironic is the, the uh, UFO community has said, this is great progress because the uh, Navy uh, has... Uh, uh, requested uh, testi more testimony, and they are re uh, reinstating the uh, reporting. Well, <laughs> you know, I remember the days working with Dr. Heineck on the Project Blue Book files. There were hundreds of reports from the Navy. The Navy had a, a reporting uh, uh, sequence, you know, reporting regulation, uh, that was parallel to uh, JANAP and to the other regulations of the of the Air Force, and they were reporting into Project Blue Book. Uh, the the Air Force was the point of contact for uh, all the armed forces, and so uh, I remember going through a, a number of cases from the Navy when I built a database for Project Blue Book, and the uh, uh, then they closed down Project Blue Book, and the Navy went its own way, not gathering those cases anymore, and now they are reinstating the, the same protocol. That doesn't mean necessarily a recognition of that these things are unexplained. It means a recognition that uh, we want to track, or they want to track those things. It also means they are not going to be made public. So I think it's a reverse of what the UFO community is expecting. Absolutely. Uh, guess what? We have Alan on the line. Alan Silverman, welcome to the show. Hey, Martin. Thanks for having me. Hey, Shaq. Good, uh, good afternoon. Hey, como estas? <laughs> Muy bien, y tú? Bastante bien. <laughs> yeah, let's just <laughs> let's just do the rest of the show in Spanish. <laughs> <That's fun. laughs> that right. will be fun. That will be fun. Either Spanish or French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. lost. On I, I will let you talk to Alan. Uh, 
uh, I know you're eager to talk to him and get his his side of the story. Well, well, Jacques, I'll tell you, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it because I've been told today that you don't go on too many shows, and it's just uh, I feel really oh, well, honored. And uh, thank you. Well, so this much. movie is uh, is exceptional. So yes, all right. Thank you. thank you very much. All right, you take care. Thank you, Jack. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. All right, Alan. Right. So let me uh, let's see. So you are a filmmaker, and I, I think you know watching this film, I was uh, saying I think it was it's it was a very good film and I was really um, glad that um, when shock uh, you contacted him and he said sure you know he got involved right away which is uh, that must have been really exciting for you it was indeed it, I was shooting but that time I think it was in the middle of the shooting of this movie and then I got this idea to write him and send him like a letter telling him about what we were doing with this film, what was the, like, the message behind this story of Juan Perez. And I also told him that Juan was not doing good. He was feeling uh, really lonely after the encounter that he had when he was 12. He got some, like, gifts or curse because he felt that the the premonition dreams that he had, it was more like a curse instead of a gift. And he was really suffering because of these consequences that he had. He also received mockery from his family, from his relatives, his friends. Um, and I didn't know that he would remember this case because uh, Jack only mentioned in two of his books in Forbidden Science and in Confrontations. But, you know, Jack, he read thousands and thousands of cases around the globe. But I just gave that shot and I asked him to go to San Francisco and do this interview. Jack is a very low profile person, so I didn't want to interrupt his project. I just want to have his opinion about the case, and that's it. And he gave me the idea to go to Argentina, to stay with Juan, to try to help him. And for me, it was one of the most important gifts in my life. And the movie changed completely when he appeared. So it was a truly pleasure to have on to have him on board. Yeah, I... I totally get that. It must have been quite amazing. So uh, we are going to go into a break. So hang on, uh, everyone. We'll be right back uh, right after these messages. And over on YouTube, we are going to go into a break there as well. And uh, just to uh, straighten something out, we'll be right back at you. Welcome back to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And uh, that was wonderful to have Jacques uh, Valet on. And now my guest is Alan Stiverman. And we're going to be talking about his uh, v very interesting movie. I highly recommend it, A Witness of Another World. Welcome back, Alan. And I think we, Thank got, you, you, all, Martin. we got you all straightened out. Uh, there is a little delay on, uh, we can't figure out how to fix that on the video, but the people on YouTube will, will just have to suffer with that. It's no problem at all. You are in Spain, right? Yes, I'm in Spain, in Seville, in the south of Spain. Ah, so we're talking to you kind of in the middle of the night. That's <laughs> yes. That's, that's the one bummer of doing the uh, the live shows. This is uh, what some people will uh, will have to put up with. So I want to ask you. We'll get right back into the movie here in a minute. But I also want to ask you what got you interested in, you know, exploring this topic because I saw in the movie you had yourself a collection of UFO books going, you know, back pretty mm -hmm. far. Yes, well, the, the background of this story, it's uh, when I was writing a script in 2013, but that time I was doing automatic writing, and then I realized that I was writing a story about an abduction, a couple that was abducted by some entities, and then I start to say, like, why I was writing this kind of story, because I never researched or investigate about UFO. I didn't, by that time, I 
did not know anything about UFO or aliens. My mainly subject was archaeology, uh, the search of a lost civilization, ancient civilizations, and that's it. And what is below Earth? For 10 years, I was uh, searching on these topics. And then I started to, I stopped the writing after 30 pages. And then I started to read and read about abduction, mainly about abduction. I read the books from John Mack, and I also bought a book from a psychiatrist and a psychologist from Argentina. It's a, it's a book about cases, uh, abduction cases from Argentina mainly. And one of the chapters, it's about the Juan Perez case. And the funny thing happened when I was presenting my previous movie, Humano, in Rosario City. It's a city four hours away from Buenos Aires. When I was presenting my, my movie there, while I was talking to the audience, I was having the book of the abductions from Argentina in my hand. And in the audience was the author of this book. <laughs> And wow. he, he, couldn't, he couldn't believe that I was having his book because it was <laughs> sold out 15 years ago. And then he approached to me and said, this is not a, by chance. This is a big synchronicity. We have to meet each other. Let's go to lunch the next day. So while we were eating pizza, he started, he started to tell me about the mo one of the most significant cases for him, that it was the Juan's first case, and he showed me a small video uh, of Juan talking to uh, an audience while when he was 18 years old. It's in the movie, it's in the beginning of the movie, this, this footage, mm -hmm. and, and you see Juan trying to explain what, what he lived when he was 12, and he couldn't explain to this audience what happened to him. He grabs his hand, his head, and said something like, you won't believe me. And then I realized that I was seeing for the first time someone who, who witnessed something supernatural and he wasn't able to explain it. For me, it was a, a, a magical moment because I never, but I never meet someone who witnesses uh, something supernatural or a contactee. It was my first time. So immediately after I saw that video, I. I told to to Dr. Nestor Berlanda that I want to meet that person, that I, I really need to meet that person. I don't know why, but I have to do it. And four months later, I went to the countryside with Dr. Nestor Berlanda. I met Juan. It was one of the most significant uh, meetings that I ever had. It was truly powerful. I tried, but that time I, I wanted to make a short film about an abduction case. And then I took the case of Juan as an example of that. But then while I was shooting, he started to, to talk, uh, to explain to me the, the case that he had. And then he started to cry. He broke, he was, he was really suffering while he was explaining to me what he saw. And then I stopped stopped my camera, I couldn't do it, I couldn't record anymore. Then I sit, I sat down next to him and tried to just to listen. And three years later, we did this movie in wow. order to, to get answers to, to Juan. Wow, that is amazing. So just by your patience and your understanding, this is how you were able to do that. Because I know somewhere in the movie you say something like, you're trying to find the time to speak to him about this. Yeah. You know, first you're like, you know, getting to know him and all that. And just a quick question just came to mind. It's kind of off the subject a little bit, but that is such a remote place. Where on earth did you did you stay somewhere near there? Uh, no, no, no. We stayed in the house. You stayed <laughs> in the house. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. What an yeah. experience that must have been. <laughs> True. Yeah. It, the first two days, it was really hard because I there bet. was, yeah, it was really wet. The house was really wet. It was hard to breathe during the nights, mm. but it was quite amazing. It was really, 
for me, I stayed with, with Juan, but the, the whole crew was with me. The sound operator, the, the cameraman, the producer. It was a really, we were cooking, we, we cooked together, we cleaned together. It was a truly wonderful experience for all of us. It was the, the best way to try to get this kind of portrait because the movie tries to portray the soul of a suffering man. But yes. the, the tricky part is that he suffered, he's suffering from a supernatural trauma that is not really common. That's right. And uh, I think that is portrayed very well in the film, uh, how you capture all that. Uh, do you, the, the one thing I'm sure that people, I haven't looked in the chat room or anything, but I'm sure people are curious about his sighting. And uh, can you explain you know, what he, he claims he saw. I mean, you, you do show that in the film, and it's really quite extraordinary. Well, I think Jack told you a little bit about the case. I will try to summarize it. It was early in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, as he usually used to, to do is before to go to the school, he, went, he goes to the to the farm and he go, he went to find the herd of horses. He, he got into his horse, Comet, that was the name of his horse. And then while he was riding, he crossed uh, a big bank of fog. And then after that, he saw uh, a, white, a white object round it that was landing on the on the earth on the ground. It, if you if you read if you read the original report, you will see that Juan was describing something similar to a tractor or to a house for workers from the farm. He never used the word UFO or a ship or spacecraft. He only used the word tractor because his mind his conscious was only used to see uh, objects similar, no, uh, used to see objects from the farm, from his culture. He never mm -hmm. saw the, uh, uh, I don't know, a close encounter for the th uh, f from the third kind or UFO movies. He was a really simple man from the countryside living with his family. So his description was he was seeing a white rounded object that was landed on the earth, a door opened it, and he saw a tall beam from around two meters and a half or three meters that was inviting him to, to, to climb up and enter to this object, let's say a ship. A ladder, a, a, if, how do I say, like goes down into the, into the ground and then Juan climbs up and when he's in, uh, when he entered into the ship, what he saw was like excuse in me the left no don't worry in the left side there was a small being like a meter and a half, and he was cutting meat on a table. The detail was that the this meat uh, didn't have blood in around around it. And in the right side, there was a tall, this tall being from three meters. He was like looking into different monitors and using something similar to a keyboard, but without buttons. It was like a keyboard from a, like an iPad, for example. And another big detail was that in front of one, there was like a wall a transparent wall or a mirror, a a something like an electromagnetic field that was uh, that didn't allow to Juan to enter to the other side of the room. It it was impossible for him to cross it. But the little one uh, could go from one side to the other without any kind of issues. Then. Juan gets uh, off the, the ship because he was really afraid from his father because he was really strict, very severe. 
And then he realized that his horse was really injured because he was kicking <coughs> to the ladder and he was really uh, suffering. And then the, uh, the tall being uh, comes down to, the, to where Juan was and Juan asked this tall being for help because his horse was really injured. Now I want to stop this narrative because two things happen. In the original report, Juan goes back to his house, but before that, the tall being started to squeeze the right arm of Juan. Juan, now he has a, a mark that was part of the initial contact from this tall being. And after that, the this tall being gave to Juan one of his gloves as a gift because the tall being told Juan to, to get this as a gift in order to others to believe him that this was true, this contact was true. But a hundred meters before he could arrive to his home, three lights goes off the, this ship and took that, uh, took the, the, that glove and yeah, they took it away. Oh. But this scene is not part of the movie. Why? When we were do while while we were doing the regression to Juan after two hours of regression, a lost memory popped up. When while he was like having this, um, while this tall being was squeezing the arm of Juan, Juan started to have something similar to a vision. I don't, I don't want to say that he traveled while he was having this vision because we don't know that, but he had a vision, a very strange vision. And after that, he started to cry and cry a lot. It was very emotional for him and for, all, for the rest of us also. And we had to cut it because it was... It was very powerful, and, and, and we were doing two hours of that regression. So I want to stop here and, and try to not make more spoilers, but that was what happened to Juan. It was not so much traumatic. The experience was not traumatic because he entered voluntarily to the ship. It was not a technical, uh, it was not an abduction technically. It was, he entered like by his mm, volunte volunteerly. Mm -hmm. I think you put that across pretty well on the movie. He climbs up the ladder himself and, you know, goes right in. And um, I don't know if I'd have the courage to do something like that, especially at that young age. Um, so you're saying that he has not, obviously he has not, watched TV, first of all. He's never watched TV or seen any type of UFO movie or anything along those lines or probably not even talked about, nothing in magazines, things like that. And you said that he was thinking it was a tractor. What made him, you know, he must have thought there was so much more to it. Um, so what did he do when he got home? That part's not really talked about in the movie. When he got home to his family... How did he proceed? And yeah. He tried to explain to his family what he saw, but no one believed him. It was really difficult for him because he was a really shy guy and it was hard to him to explain, but no one believed him. So after that, he started to go inside more and more and not to talk. And I, th I think while when he was 17, around that age, he left his home and started to, to work from on different haciendas and ranches all across the, the country. Now, at the very end of the film, it shows him on, on a jet basically going, was he going home at that point? Is that ac actually what he was doing? At the end of the movie? Yeah, toward the end of the movie. He's on a jet. Oh, and no. It's, well, it's, um, 
in a way, it's going home, but it's like uh, a metaphor because he's, you, as you saw in the movie, we, we try to connect Juan to his roots, to his ancestors. I see. Because, mm -hmm. Yeah, because Juan has uh, an indigenous lineage that was cut off when his grandfather died, when his grandfather passes, passed away. So one of the questions that I had wh while I was doing this, this project was if there is a connection between uh, the lineage of these contactees and the UFO phenomenon. Because in the, one of the background story of this, of this movie is that when I met his mother, she confessed to me and only to me, even Juan didn't know the, about this secret. She also was a contactee when she was a teenager. Wow. But but that time I didn't know what to do with that information. It was really the, what she told me was really very intimate and very dark in a way because she was really suffering because she thought by that time that Juan will be a, like will be kidnapped by this entity because Juan, she she always mentioned to me that Juan was marked. She was referring to the mark that Juan had in his yes. in his arm. Yeah. So I tried to say to her, just uh, don't worry. I just I I'm coming here in order to help you, to help Juan, to give a message to the world because there are plenty of Juan Perez in the world not knowing what is happening in their life, and that's the only word that come across my mind in order to try to calm to calm her. And I think that confession was so powerful to me that it was my the fuel to do this movie because I, I needed to understand what happened to Juan, what happened to his mother. And one of the most beautiful things that happened with this movie was that while we were presenting the movie in his hometown, in the cinema of Venado Tuerto, his hometown, the half of the cinema was the relative of Juan. Wow. So after the movie ends, uh, the whole family was crying a lot. And I saw he, he, uh, his sisters, his brothers saying to him, like, I'm so sorry, brother. Now I understand you. I'm so sorry. Wow. I was so stupid. So sorry. Now I understand why, I, why, why you were so lonely while you were suffering. Now I understand. And what happened with his mother was that she confessed to Juan that she was also a contactee, that she suffered the same uh, as Juan uh, did. And it was a really special conversation, conversation because a healing process was spontane spontaneously uh, like thanks to the process of, of this movie, a person healed, a family healed, and a whole community healed. So it was, wow. I, I was really honored by witnessing this, this thing. It was something that I, I wasn't expecting to, to, to see. Wow, that is amazing. So we're right at the break, so we're gonna go to break now. And when we come back a little bit later in the show, we're going to be taking calls. If anyone wants to call in, I'll give the number at that time. And uh, my guest right now is uh, Alan Stivelman. And we'll be back right after these messages. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. My guest is Alan Stivelman, and we're talking about his movie, Witness of Another World, which features uh, Juan, a gaucho that lives by himself in the middle of nowhere with his animals and farm, um, mostly because of an encounter that he had that made him want to isolate. Uh, before we get started in the show, I just want to do a quick little shout out. Uh, Lee Spiegel, I hope people are listening to his show. It's on KGRA radio every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
Um, so Lee, I, I had the honor of going to Lee's wedding, uh, Lee Spiegel and his now wife, Lorraine, uh, out in Long Island. I got to hang out with Alejandro uh, all weekend and Mark D'Antonio. We had a, we had a blast. Um, it was fun and just a lovely wedding. And they are lovely people. And I do uh, want to say that uh, I probably wouldn't have had a shock on the show if it wasn't for Lee because they're good friends. And I think Lee may have put in a good word. I'm not really sure. But anyway, I wanted to just wish Lee and Lorraine a long and happy life. Uh, they are such a wonderful couple. And that's it. Uh, we are back with our guest tonight, Alan. Uh, Alan, um, so this whole thing um, that you were talking about in the, the village and uh, also uh, Juan's mother, uh, it, it seemed to, I, I'm just kind of piecing together that if nothing else, this made all your hard work worth it. Is that what you would say? Just, you know, with the, uh, the conclusion at the end, basically. Yes, I think it, it's totally worth it because I had two options while I was doing this, this project. At the end of the script, one of the intentions of the movie was trying to, to show a movie in new theories about the UFO phenomenon. For example, the theories of Dr. Jacques Vallée about the interdimensional aspect of the phenomenon. It, w- it, will, it was going to be a documentary about more about the UFO phenomenon rather than a, the witness aspect of the phenomenon. But then when I saw <laughs> all of the details that, uh, that this case has, and after dealing with the suffering of Juan, all my effort went to try to get answers to Juan, to try to help him to make a more, to try to relieve that man. And it totally worth it because the results of that journey was really amazing. I met three shamans, I met Dr. Jack Ballet, I met Dr. Nestor Berlanda, and uh, the whole people were like in the same path. We all wanted to make a better living for Juan. And all the conclusions were thanks to him because no one told him that, for example, Juan, what you saw was A, or Jack Valley, what you saw was B, etc. No one told him. It, it, the, as you saw in the movie, it's an, it's an open movie because we don't want to get some straight answers for this phenomenon. But what we took was the human aspect that the phenomenon has. And it's not well portrayed in the movies because we only focus on the on the what the witnesses saw and that's it. And I wanted to go more deep into the question that if there is a relationship between our consciousness and the UFO phenomenon, I try to to get evidence from that. And I think Juan was one of the most important person that could try to get like could get answers for it because he when he when he suffered this event, he was twelve years old, he was very innocent, he was very pure, and he carried that suffering for more than four decades, so it's a long long time of of, of this kind of trauma. But one of the important things that we noticed was that the event was not the traumatic part for him. Because by that time I thought that the experience was really powerful for him, that he couldn't deal. It. But the, the most terrible part was the consequences that he had after the event, after mm-hmm. the contact. And that was the premonition dreams. That was the a living hell for him. That was his truly nightmare. Yes, he would have this dream over and over again, basically. Every night. Every night. He every has. night? Oh, my God. I didn't realize it was every night. Oh. 
yeah, every night, but he tries, he tried to stop that dream because he knows that if he go to sleep he, on his right arm, he will enter to this real dream. But if he dreams like looking uh, to, uh, above his, uh, his back or into on the, his left side, he will have a regular dream. He knows how to difference him. And he told me that the real dream is more real than our reality. He said, mm. like, it's real. It's more real than, than ours. It's more real than the reality. Is the way that he got to to try to describe what he he felt well, while I have, he was having these dreams. I've actually had a few dreams in my life that were just so incredibly real. Like I, I just mm. couldn't believe that. You know, so I I sort of understand that. One of the questions I have for you, as far as Juan's mother goes, did she? Because she had an experience herself. Did she try to comfort him in in any way? Or did she just, no. well, isn't that something? Wouldn't you think a mother would? Um, yeah. Hmm. But also, she's a really special woman. His, her experience was so traumatic for her that she couldn't help anyone. For example, there was a particular thing on, on her that she doesn't want to be touched by anyone, even her kids and her children's. And you said like, it's really strange because a mother wants to be touched, to receive a hug or whatever, but she, she didn't want it. But after we, we did this movie, she confessed to Juan why she had this feeling that she doesn't want to be touched. It's not because she was like evil or something like that. Is because that when she is touched by someone, she receives information from the other one. Mm. For, for example, she saw she can see the future. She can see like if someone is going to die, or the same that happened to Juan when he dreamed. So, when he was 50 years old, Juan get an got an answer of something that was pretty common because he thought that, well, my mother doesn't want to be touched and that's it. She's something, she's a little bit crazy. But now there is a very deep, uh, there is a very deep meaning of why she doesn't want to be touched. And now Juan uh, got an answer and could understand her why she wasn't, uh, she, why, why he couldn't get support from her mm. because she was living in a, she was living in a, a, a living hell. She was suffering a lot. Wow. Do you think this has made them become closer? Um, yeah. Definitely. Yes, because now Juan is living with his family. He, really? He, yeah, he recovered his family. It was now Juan is, is, is happy, he could integrate his experience. Now he understands why this is, uh, these things are happening to him in a way. I don't know what, what is his conclusion, but now he understands that he's not alone. There is a, a whole tribe in Paraguay that, that had the same dreams that he has. So because by that time when he, he thought that he was the only one in the whole world that suffered from this experience, he, he is not an internet user, he didn't know that there are plenty of cases around the globe, he thought that he was the only one, so mm -hmm. that's why he like lived as a monk as a refugee in the countryside by himself with his animals, and that's it. Wow. I guess this is just a case of that it will show you when someone experiences something like this without any support, you know, what happens um, to them or can happen to their lives. Like, this is what we'd call PSD, uh, PSD. 
TD or something like that? PTSD, Post, yeah. yeah. Traumatic, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we had, we definitely had that. You can see that um, in, you know, just as soon as he talks about it. And uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, so let's see. I wanted to, something I have forgotten to ask you, and that is, um, where can someone see the movie and when? <laughs> I never asked oh, you that. It, it will be released next week on October 22nd. It will be live on multiple platforms such as iTunes, Amazon, Google. On our on our official website, you you can have more information. It's witnessofanotherworld.com, and if you subscribe to our website, you you will receive plenty of information, exclusive contents, and I will let you know when this movie will be live. And are there different platforms that people can? see this on well vimeo for example it will be another one i think netflix will will be uh, it will not depend on us it will depend on netflix but we are trying to pitch them so probably you will get some news in six months oh okay uh, netflix would be nice that would be really good exposure yeah and yeah. they seem to have a few shows um like this that are related to that. They're not afraid to step away, you know, stay away. They're not trying to stay away from these type of topics, it seems. Hmm. The, you know? Yeah. And I I don't know. I, I think it's a great movie. And have you, uh, like, just, it's just going to be your one-off? Or do you think you may do another movie um, about this topic at some point? Well, I want to make a TV series about witnesses from all over the globe and try to focus on the human aspect of this subject. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not up to me if, if I can find a production company. Probably we will do it as soon as possible. But in the meantime, I'm uh, developing, developing uh, in the, um, it's a movie that it will be released, I think, in three years because I'm still getting funds. It's about this lost civilization, and I think it's there is a connection between the UFO and the underworld, and uh, we are going to 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 try to find evidence, hardcore evidence about this lost civilization that was settled in America thousands and thousands years ago. I know there's a, there's a, at one point you show images on rocks; those are always so intriguing. That uh, mm. and I, I know um, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot in Argentina, and it's a pretty rich country as far as uh, you know early civilizations. Are uh, there a lot of, um, you know, like so to speak, ancient alien, um, you know, folklore and stuff uh, in Argentina? No, not so much. Mainly uh, in Peru, for example, in the Andes or in Bolivia, because in Argentina there is not so much culture in archaeology. It's a really brand new country in those topics, but I think in the near future we will have new answers about the ancestors in in Argentina. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um I would like to be able to uh, take calls now. Are you up for that? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, it would be so, my first experience with that. But let's <laughs> that's do it. okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna the numbers up on the screen for um, over at YouTube, but for you, you over at KGRA uh, Radio, that number is eight five five four seven two five four eight three, and we'll welcome your call if you'd like to. Uh, if you'd like to call in and ask our guest a question. Um, so in general, what would you say the topic of UFOs is um, as looked at in your country? Mm, are you referring like what is the opinion? Yes, the what is the general opinion of uh, when it well, comes to the mm, UFO topic? It's, it's difficult because it is no one, I think, Generally speaking, when I talk about this subject with my family or with my friends, 
they believe that there is something else in the universe for sure. But if we come into the UFO aspect, especially what sh what the movie shows on the subject or the TV news, uh, it's pretty funny for them, the, the way that it's exposed, the, the phenomenon. So that's one of the reasons why the witnesses in Argentina and I think in the whole world received mockery from them because I think by the way that the news or the movies shows these portraits, this phenomenon. It's more like they mock her from the from for the phenom from the phenomenon. So that's why I tried to make a serious movie about this, the human aspect, the consequences that real people are suffering from those events. So, mm -hmm. but people are from Argentina or South America are quite skeptic on, on this matter. Well, you know, when it comes to Chile, for instance, they are taking the topic fairly seriously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have the government involved. I've had uh, Jose, Le on the, Jose Lai on the show a number of times. And, uh, you know, they definitely are taking, they have for many years, uh, taken the topic seriously. And a few other, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's also in France where shock is yeah. from. Um, so yeah. uh, hopefully that won't last forever um, because... Uh, there's no denying that there's something to this, whatever it is. Who knows? But there's definitely something mm -hmm. going on. Exactly. And so if you um, – I understand how – I don't think any not, – not a lot of people really think about this too much, but I understand how it – how much money it costs to put together these type of things, like your movie and, uh, you know, to get funding is very diff tricky and difficult. Is that even more difficult because of where you are uh, with the no. – <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, well, the last year, it was really a nightmare because it was really hard to get a deal with this kind of movie. And of course, ooh, I'm from Argentina, from Latin America, and it's I think it's the first movie that talks about the supernatural in Latin America. So it's really hard yeah. to, to get deals around this kind of subject. So I was really suffering last year because it was it's a movie that cost us a lot of money. I get investors, my family, friends, and I I I said to myself that it will be my last movie. I don't want I want to quit films to do in film because it's a real it's a roller coaster. You know, it's it's nice when you do it. It's nice when you show us to show show it to to people, but when you when you try to get sales and try to get some revenues and recover all the money, it's really hard when you don't have the support from the distributors, from the exhibitors. But a few months ago, we get a deal with the um, 1091 Media, formerly known as the Orchard. And oh, wow. We are mm -hmm. yeah, and we are really eager to see what happens with the movie and the results will be, it will be just a, a surprise because we don't know what will happen with, with the, with the audience, if they will like it or not. I think they will love it, but it's not up to me. It depends on, on the market. That's and right. The, the movie market, it's really tough. It's really, mm -hmm. it's really, really tough. It's a dirty ground. Yeah. I, I talked to a lot of people that um, are have told me uh, basically their struggles so um, in, yeah. in filmmaking and so um, again the line is open that's eight five five four seven two five four eight three if you'd like to um, give a call and if, also if you've had an experience that you want to talk about that's also you can bring that up if you don't have a immediate um, question for our our guests um, so do you think uh, I mean um, you're saying that you're going to release the movie um, also in your, your country, basically. So, of, of course, you have a Spanish version of this, and and you have, you know, the English version, basically, is what we're, we're going to be seeing here. 
Um, and so do you have uh, different accesses to, for instance, to get the movie out there in your own country, or are you just trying any, any type of venue, basically? No, we will mainly focus on the digital release of the movie mm -hmm. because this uh, distribution company got the rights for worldwide. So the movie will be released, the English version for all the English spoken countries mm -hmm. and the Spanish version for all Latin America. But the, the main venue will be the streaming, the transactional um, yeah, the transactional um, streaming, mm -hmm. the pay-per-view. Right. I just found out you're going to be on my friend Alejandro's show coming up. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Alejandro Rojas, right? Yeah, that's right. Yes. He couldn't be with us tonight. He's actually uh, traveling. But um, so um, this is really interesting. I'm so glad that you actually uh, were able to be on this show and talk about this film and and you know I I always uh, I'm a little skeptical sometimes when someone sends me like oh you know we have someone that can be on your show and all that but after I watched the movie um, it really moved me and I was saying yeah I'm glad I'm having you know this um, you know these people on my show and also just the fact that you do focus on the human part of it I think that's so important and when, um, you know, other shows may focus more or less on the event itself, that was just a little yeah. part of the movie. It was uh, mostly about the Ten minutes, the yeah, aftermath. ten minutes, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your words. And that's what I wanted to, to do, just to focus on the human aspect, because it's sometimes the answers to some questions are in front of us. But we are like we are blinded by these lights, or we want to know more about these lights, and it's very it's very difficult because it's not a one man job, as as Dr. Ballet said many times that if we want to know more about this UFO phenomenon, it requires a really big manpower. We need to gather plenty of scientists from all over the world and yeah it's not just one man job and not a one filmmaker job so i try i only focused on juan illness and try to relieve him a little bit more now there were other people on your, in that particular movie that actually had experiences or one at least one in particular that was uh, was talking about it um now, when Shock said that there was uh, related cases, that had nothing to do with the uh, other related cases, did it? Well, uh, Jack told me that there were uh, three other cases the same week and in the same area of Juan. And I tried to connect to them. One was dead, but the other two were were still alive. One was a carpenter, the, camp the carpenter of the home of the, this town, Venado Tuerto, and the other one was in a, in a city four hours away from from Venado Tuerto. And I me, met the and I met them. I I could I record an interview with them, and it was really really good because what I realized from them is that they still have the innocence from that from from their childhood, for example, because when, if you meet Juan, for example, you will see that he's a grown man, he's 52, but you will see that behind that appearance, there is still a child yes. uh, behind behind it. And the same happened with the, the other two witnesses. It, hmm. But the, the, the difference was that the other two run away immediately after the phenomenon came to them. One was the only one who remained in the place and got the contact from this phenomenon. Um, but this, it, for them was a really hard experience to, for example, um, Carlos and Roberto, 
I think Roberto was in his bed for a month. He couldn't do anything after that event. It was really traumatic for him. And Carlos, a week, a, a whole week was inside of his home without seeing anyone. It was really hard because in, in, the, in the case of Carlos, he was driving his car, car and suddenly stopped and he saw in his right window seven UFO ships. Some of them were landing and the other one were, were still in, in, the, in the air. And one of them was above his car. And, and then he was really scared, really scared, asking to God, help me, help me. And then his engine uh, turned out, turned on, and he ran away, and he couldn't make any kind of contact. But that experience was really, really traumatic for him. Wow, amazing! Those uh, those cases where the car just you know shut the engine shuts off are just phenomenal, and there's been so many yeah. in so many places. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've told a story a few times here of um, someone in Russia that uh, it was just ca came up in a casual conversation. Um, I'll, I'll tell this story quickly again for no one that's heard it, but this is someone that has, you know, had no idea what a UFO was or anything like that. And he was going through a mountain pass, and all of a sudden all the cars stopped. And I drove, last time I was in Russia, I drove through this pass to see where it was, and it's very, very busy as far as cars go. A lot of cars go through there. And so they all pulled over to the side of the road. Some got out, lifted their engine, you know, their hoods to look at their engine and see what was going on. And all of a sudden, um, someone yelled or something, and a cigar-shaped craft went right through the mountain pass, right over their head, and it's, he said there was even portholes. He was describing the little porthole windows in it. <laughs> and then it went through the pass, no sound at all, and then someone jumped in their car and their engine started. Everyone else jumped in the car and all their engines started and they just drove off. Nobody talked about it or talked to each other. And wow. That, that, that was it. But it was just another case where, um, you know, all the, it affected the engines, which hmm. who, who knows what causes that. That's pretty amazing. Electromagnetics, I guess. Um, so anyway, the line's still open. Um, you know, I should check to see if anyone's called in. No one has called in yet. Uh, you're welcome to call in, and that's 855-472-5483. Uh, Where are my callers tonight? Uh, please do call in. And uh, I will be checking chat if someone wants to post some questions up there for our guests. Are you, um, as far as this movie goes, if um, it's really a, a great success and all that. Do you think that people will reach out to Juan in particular, try to reach him? Or do they even know maybe, where they would find maybe, him? Maybe, but it's really hard to find him because <laughs> yeah, I bet. He, doesn't use, <laughs> he doesn't use a phone. He doesn't have any kind of cell phone. And he lives r far away from Benado Tuero. He lives in the middle of the countryside with his family. But I think there will be some people that want that will that will want to to contact him. The same happened in Argentina. After the the movie went to the theaters, I think at least five person wanted to contact him, and and they found it, and it was quite amazing. The experience was for Juan was really fun because he now he he, he usually tells me like now I have more friends. Right. That's, so that's imagine really good. There, he was really lonely for four decades, and now he's someone who has friends that people are really are really worried about him. He want they want to know more about about his case, about Juan. So it's it's a new experience for for him. He he does he didn't quit his his homework or he because he still going to hunt, he, he, he's still doing uh, the farm work, he's taking care of his animal, and that's the only thing that he, he really loved to do. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could tell. You could tell that. I, I don't know how someone just goes off in the wilderness and just lives like that. It just always baffles me how they can basically live off the land and, and survive. It's amazing. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing. Was there actually electricity in the house? Uh, what? Well, no, we use. There was no electricity, but for the shooting, we use. Uh, how do we say? Like a motor. A for... generator. Yeah, a generator. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, thank you for speaking English, by the way. I mean, I know you had to speak English to do the show, but I know it's not easy for you, and you're you're doing a wonderful job. So thank you. Thank you. It's not it's not easy to speak this subject in Spanish. <laughs> So in English, it's even more difficult. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Um, if um, if you had to do the whole thing over again, you know, uh, I, I talked to a lot of, like I said earlier, I talked to a lot of people that are filmmakers, and they always basically tell me the same thing, and it sounds like this happened to you. Like the film takes on a, a life of its own and kind of morphs. Mm. You know, you start out one, uh, it's kind of like when um, someone's painting a painting, an, an abstract painting, they don't know what's going to, yeah. uh, you know, they start one place and they don't know where it's going to end. Um, and the road that this this took and all the different turns and stuff like this, um, you mentioned earlier on that you talked with one the first time and really, uh, you know, gained his confidence and then you took three years before you mm. you went back. Um, that that's amazing to me that you actually went through that trouble because uh, most people want the the quick fix. I have uh, mm. and and want to get something done and you know get it in the can so to speak, get it and get it out. <laughs> but you really took your time with yeah. this. And yes, because it was really hard in speaking in uh, emotional level because. I was dealing well, with with a person, with a heart, with a soul, with a mind. So I wasn't prepared on that time to make this the film because I, I didn't know where to start, where to end. So I needed to focus just on reading about this subject. So I read plenty of books about UFO. I read plenty of books about psychology. I love psychology also. And I tried just to to train myself in order to to make this film happen because I wanted to have plenty of tools to to deal with Juan, but also to deal with Jacques Vallée because mm-hmm. I was going to interview one of the greatest men on earth about this this phenomenon, so it was not easy, and I had to because I deal with shamans that they are not easy to deal. And we were gifted by them because it was the first time that they spoke about the secrets. Because for them, talking about the UFO, it's the same to, to talk about God or a divinity. Because for them, the UFO phenomenon comes from a, from a spiritual realm. So it was the first time for them to speak freely about this subject. And for that, I thanks to the Warani people because it was I was honored by them, and they trust on me, so it was uh, a good deal for both of us. And so it was as a filmmaker, it was a really a truly challenge because I have to deal with shamans, with Dr. Jack Ballet, with Juan, a psychiatrist. So mm-hmm. it was more like a big puzzle with plenty of pieces and the movie was just about to get all these pieces together and get this puzzle done. When you decided, or it was, I'm guessing it was your idea, uh, may not have been, um, to subject one to a uh, hypnotist, you know, regression, uh, the regression hi- hypnotherapy um how did you go about choosing someone for that in particular and how did all that evolve well i chose um dr nestor berlanda because i trust him and also he juan trust on 
on, on him also. And the other thing that I liked from him is that he does he he doesn't use the technique of hypnosis. It's quite different because hypnosis is way much deeper than this uh, technique. This is more like a meditation or a le- relaxation. And the main aspect is that when the patient or the witness wakes up, he will remember everything that he had on the regression. The hypnosis is very difficult, very different because the the patient won't remember anything from that uh, regression. Hmm. He is and the and Juan was in control from um, the, the the whole moment. He was in charge of what he wanted to share and what he or or what he doesn't want it to share because in a hypnosis if the therapist say for example what are you seeing every time the the patient will will answer something because he want to please the 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 therapist on this technique it's very different because one will answer whatever he wants to, to answer. Sometimes he wo- he went to silent, silence for several minutes and we didn't know what was happening or what he was seeing around his, his experience. So were you there? Were you there the entire time? Yes, I was there. And a funny thing that happened was that while we were doing this regression, everyone in the shooting room and the room next to to us, everyone fall asleep. Ah. Five, everyone, <laughs> everyone fall asleep. We don't know what. And the other thing that happened that was really strange is that when Juan was interacting with the phenomenon, like asking questions to the this tall being, the light that was uh, with batteries started. To flicker like like this, for example. Let me show you. I have this light that is with battery. You see that it, it started to make like this this kind of movement. It was quite strange, and we didn't we didn't know what was happening because if it, this kind of lights with battery, they they shouldn't have this kind of issues. But it was in the moment that Juan was interacting with the phenomenon. Not wow. before, nor after. Just in the when he, when he was asking, for example, why to me? What are you doing here? What do you mean by working, etc.? That's totally amazing. Uh, we have a caller on the line. We have Ricardo uh, calling from London. Ricardo, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Stop, Mr. Willis. Yes, thanks for the call. Oh, thank you so much. On my pleasure, I'm um, subscribed to your YouTube channel. It's the first time that um, I'm seeing your program. It's really interesting. And I'm from the same country than, than Alan. Um, not far from that town, from Bernardo Tuerto, where this um, event happened. Oh, wow. Um, like he's talking about the film. And I used to be in two years. I used to be in a group that was in the same town that Nesto Berlanda psychiatrist. He, he was mentioning Nesto Berlanda, a psychiatrist or psychologist who was helping him to make the film. I was, I was in the, another group where two, two UFO groups at that time, you know, in the 70s, when, you know, UFOs everywhere in America, everywhere were so so common, you know. You have big um, places um, where we used to gather and discuss and learn about the, the 70s uh, era, which was so extraordinary until the 80s. Yeah. Um, so, um, no, I, may I ask, I don't, know, I don't want to take the whole, may I ask a couple of questions? Oh, yeah, to absolutely. Hello, Alan, the, the, the countryman of mine. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for the program. Uh, thank you to you, Martin, to Alan, which is really interesting. It's the first time that... I just dis- discovered this through YouTube, and I'm going to start uh, watching your program. I wanted to ask um, two things. First of all, Alan, if he 
Apart from making film, is he a ufologist or was or is into UFOs or being into the field or is it mainly a filmmaker? And secondly, a question tonight I've been to, um, strangely, I went to a poltergeist meeting with perhaps one of the best British uh, paranormal investigator, which is Alan Mordi. He was the head of the ghost um, club in Britain, which is older than the Society for Psychic Creatures. And briefly, he mentioned that that a guy, Lion Playfair, who was the researcher of the Enfield Poltergeist, one of the most famous cases in the world, they made some films about the Enfield Poltergeist in London in 77, 78. Guy Lion Playfair, one of these researchers, had in 2018 wrote to Jacques Vallée, who is the person who worked with Alan in the film. He was part of the people who researched in this case. And he was talking about the connection, perhaps, between poltergeists and UFOs with what they called ultraterrestrials. I know it's a very difficult subject. I wanted to know if Alan could tell me first about if he has some UFO background or if he's mainly a filmmaker. And the theories that now Jacques Palais supports about the UFOs and also the Alan's and also yours, uh, Martin. Sorry if the question is a bit complicated, but <laughs> I came from this meeting and I said, okay, that's the moment to ask a question about <laughs> these theories that could connect, perhaps, you know, if it's not far too much far -fetched. That's all. I'll listen to you. Okay, Ricardo, thank you. Well, My hello, case, Ricardo. Uh, Martin, thank you so much. And thank you, to Alan. Oh, hello, he Alan. Hello, My Ricardo. Nice, nice to meet you. Well, uh, Thank Mainly, you. I'm a, I'm a filmmaker that mm, fall into this wonderful world of UFO and aliens. I fall in love immediately when I started in 2013 while I was writing this script about uh, an abduction case from a couple. It was a fiction story. I cannot say that I'm a, an ufologist. I can say that I have two experience with a UFO sighting. One was when I was 24, I was in Cusco, Peru, and the other was when I was 28, and I was in the same city that, that I'm right now, in Seville, in Spain. So I prefer to con be considered as a, a, an amateur, as a, a ufologist amateur. <laughs> because I think to be a ufologist is a, is a big word for me. But I was I witnessed two, two events, two, two objects, very, very strange ones. And the other question that you asked me was really, really, really important because the two questions that I had while I was doing this film, the first, the first one was if there is a connection between the UFO and the lineage of the contactees. That's the first one. And the other question was really personal for me because it was about like if there is a connection between the UFO and the afterlife. And for me, perhaps there is a connection in the poltergates and the afterlife. So when you see the movie, when you are going to see the movie, you will see that there is a small scene that tries to answer that question. Very symbolic or, I don't know, there will, there will be people that will get into that scene and they will give, you, they will give importance to that scene and the other, they won't give like... Uh, the S word to, to that scene. So for me, it was very emotional because it's the moment that Juan broke down because he's seen his grandfather in that moment. And his grandfather right. passed, mm. passed away two years ago from that event when he was 10 years old. When that happened, it was pretty... I will say funny because it wasn't on the original report. And we look 
uh, I look uh, to Dr. Nestor Berlanda and he was looking to me like saying like, I don't know what is happening. Why is he seeing his grandfather? What the f it's happening here? We don't know that. So then we stopped that uh, regression because Juan was very emotional. He was crying. He was saying, oh, my grandfather, my grandfather, I miss you so much. And then we cut it. And then I, re I remember that immediately after I went, I went outside, I start to walk around the countryside asking questions like, what, what, is, what, what is happening? The first one, what is all about? What is this all about? Why the grandfather entered into that experience? If there is the, the connection between the afterlife and the UFO phenomenon is real, there is an afterlife, et cetera, et cetera. Many questions um, came into my head. It was very difficult. But now, three years after, Ricardo, I can say you that I don't know, I don't have an answer for that, but it's still one of the most important question that I want to to get some answer from it for sure Wow yeah that is uh, there are there are people that think there's a connection between all these different things you know that people are talking about all things paranormal um, I was um, on a ride somewhere with my son one time and I was telling him about um, you know, a, a different experience that I had that was not UFO related, but it was actually, I don't know if it was a ghost or what it was, but it was actually something um, that happened that was just incredible. And I remember him turning and looking at, me, looking at me and he says, you know, no matter what people are experiencing, whether, um, you know, the total unexplainable things, each and every one of those things has a real answer as to what it really is. And, uh, which is really bizarre to think about, you know, when it, especially when it comes to an experience of poltergeists. And there's, you know, there's, yeah. a, there's a number of people that have have had experiences firsthand. And I, I actually had an experience. I don't know what it was, but, uh, you know, again, there there's an answer somewhere for, for these things. And, yeah, um, I don't think that uh, I've said many times in the show that we— we may never actually know, for instance, what what UFOs are, even though it feels like it's so close. You know, it's kind of one of the questions I should have asked uh, Jacques a little more about, like, mm. how many times have you felt, like, really close to actually figuring out what these things are? And uh, uh, mm. it'd be interesting to hear his, his answer. We, we have about three minutes left, so uh, that's going to be it for the phone calls. Um, unless someone wants to call in really quick, um, but again, we only have uh, three minutes left or so. So um, someone has posted, even though they probably new to the show, they want to know how they can watch a movie and how to get it and all that stuff one more time. Well, of course, thank you. It will be released next week on October 22nd. And you can check on our website, witnessofanotherworld.com. And if you subscribe, we will let you know when this movie will, where this movie will be uh, available. Probably it will be live on iTunes, Amazon, Google, and plenty more. Okay. And I'll put that note just for the listener. Uh, anyone can go over to my website, which is Podcast UFO. And by the way, I forgot to mention, we have a new blog um, up on the uh, website, which is about Chilean, uh, sort of related, South America, Chilean UFOs. Uh, so check that out over there, and I'll put that uh, the link to your website in the show notes because I do not do not believe they're in there right now, so they will be there when the show uh, goes out as a podcast for sure. So uh, just a couple more minutes left. Um, do you think, I guess, uh, I guess in closing, do you think that um, there are some really interesting UFO cases that you're going to look into more, or do you think you're just going to, this, so you'll move on to, um, you know, something else? Mm, I want to stay in this field. I really want, but I need support. In, sure. mm -hmm. in my personal research, I will still be looking into some really good cases, 
But if I want to make a piece of art or a movie or a TV series, I will need the support from the televisions or production companies or streaming platforms that are, I hope they are interested on continuing this, this subject. Sure. Yep, I understand totally. Thank you so much. Uh, we're at the end of our show, and I really appreciate it. It was, uh, it was really great, uh, really great speaking with you. Thank you, Martin. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. And good luck with your movie. I hope it goes really well. And I want to just say one more thing. Um, thank you for changing Juan's life. Uh, you made it a lot better. And, <laughs> thank uh, you. Very important to him. Okay. Yeah. All right. You take care. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. That's it for the show. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Next week, uh, I just found out one of we have two guests next week. I know one of them for sure is going to be Dr. Seth Shostak from the SETI Institute. He's going to be on the last part of the show. Uh, we had another astronomer on the beginning of the show, and unfortunately, he just found out he's going to be on a plane, so he's not going to be able to make it. So anyway, I want to thank everyone again for listening to the show, and uh, we'll see you here next week. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.